Good evening, everyone. How is everyone? Good, good. Glad to see you here. Well, welcome. My name's Greg Williams, and I'll be your host tonight. I'm also the director of UMBC's Instructional Systems Development Program, and I want to welcome you on half of uh, the program and, and UMBC. Um, I used to say you have a black folder, but you don't have a black folder. You have handouts tonight, so you might want to look through those and, and look at the information that's, that's in there. Tonight's event, as usual, is being videotaped, so I was just talking to someone who said they can't stay for the whole evening, but they'll have an opportunity to watch uh, the event afterwards, so it'll be on uh, YouTube, hopefully about a week or so after the, uh, the event. Um, and on the table in front of you, there's a little tent card that has the Twitter hashtag. So for those of you who are uh, Twitter folks and, and tweeters, uh, the hashtag is uh, ISD now. So feel free to uh, tweet about us. So the ISD forum, the event that we're having here tonight, well, what is it? Well, it's an event that we started about 10 years ago. Um, when I started here 10 years ago, I, I, was, I was told by someone that we have to have open houses. And I said, why do we want to do that? And they said, well, that helps recruit students. And I said, no, it doesn't really work. And they go, well, why do you say that? And I said, well, I had a phone call one time from a person who kind of looks like one of our students. And he said, well, you know, I'm a busy guy. I've got uh, a job. And I'm really busy at my job. I've got a family. I've got several kids. and." Um, Got a lot going on, taking care of some aging parents. And I'm thinking about coming to this open house tonight, but what can you tell me at this open house that is not on your website or you can't tell me over the phone right now? I said, well, uh, we're going to have good cookies. <laughs> so anyway, we had the idea to create these where we thought we would have a different sort of event to bring professional subject matter experts from uh, our field, instructional design, e-learning, training, et cetera, come and speak. And then we just tell people, and they're sponsored by the ISD program. So that's what we've done. Um, we've had them for about 10, 10 years now, and uh, I, I think they're, they're working pretty well, or at least a, a few people have, have told me that. Um, but it, essentially, you know, the reason we do these is uh, the university's mission is three-prong. It's teaching, research, and service. So service to the community is uh, one of the big reasons why we do this. And of course, for you uh, folks that are in the field, we know that all the learning that we do doesn't take place in a formal classroom. There's a lot of informal learning going on, and tonight is more of an informal learning opportunity. So I'm glad you're here, and um, it's good to see everyone. Um, Dr. Chuck Hodell is uh, the, the Associate Director of the ISD program here. He is also a um, professor here at, at UMBC, and he's a double alumni from UMBC. He has his PhD, and actually Dr. Cook taught Chuck as a student here. How about that? Again, I'm sorry, Dr. Cook. <laughs> <laughs> um, Chuck, in a way, embodies many of kind of what our students look like. He is an adult learner himself. He earned his bachelor's when he was about in his mid-30s, mid I believe, at, at Antioch. And um, he's worked many different jobs, so I think which has probably been helpful in his work with subject matter experts because he has had a number of different jobs from labor relations to uh, law enforcement um, to a telecommunications worker. Um, and he had the worst job in higher education working in the provost office at the <laughs> National Labor College. Anybody who works in higher education knows that provost is the worst job on the campus because all the faculty, you have to deal with them. All my, my colleagues. A lot of good ones, but you know. Anyway, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Chuck Hodell, who has graciously accepted my invitation to uh, come present here tonight. And Chuck said that I don't want to do a lecture. I want to do a workshop. I want to get people involved. So get ready to work, folks. So Chuck, it's all yours. Thank you, Dr. Williams. <laughs> Thanks. Before Greg gets off the stage, I think we ought to thank Greg, because he's been the director now of the program for 10 years. And the incredible things that he has done for all of you and for me and for the graduates that aren't here this evening and students yet to come follows in the footsteps of Dr. Cook. And Zane Berge, Zane, you still here? Zane, leave already? 
Okay, he said he was going to leave as soon as I got up here, so I appreciate that, Dr. Berge. Um, I could talk, well, I will anyway, it doesn't matter, I'm bigger than he is, so. But Dr. Williams has done so many things for us, and Greg, I just want to say thank you for your silent but incredibly splendid leadership and all the things you've done for me personally and for this program. And I don't think we've ever taken the time to say thank you, but thank you. Okay, so we're going to do some stuff tonight. Any of you SMEs, you ever heard of that term, Schmees, love? So you don't really need this, do you? <laughs> well, you want to take the test? The test is on your tables. You can do that. We'll get the slides up here. I want to let you know that these poor folks are students in 602 this term. They are in-class students. And how many of you took in-class 602 with me? And what were the requirements to get an A? Peanut butter pie. You can tell those who have not yet, yet come up with a peanut butter pie, except John. John's already got an A in his class. So he's fine. But they're going to help out because we're going to do lots of things. And many times in class I've heard people say and ask, how do you do the nine events with a large group? How many of you have asked that question in 602? I know some of you have. We're going to do all nine events tonight. And that's why I wish Dr. Berge was here, because <laughs> we could have fun with him. So if we can get the slides up, we'll start. We're trying, OK. Well, this is the part where I do interpretive dance. Um, if, if you could give me a moment in your life, and I will try in 30 seconds to represent that emotionally. Melissa, let's have Melissa's family stand up while we're waiting. This is an incredibly beautiful family. Stand up, folks. Look at these kids. Look at this family. I think. And now they're all saying, I'll get even with you later, right? <laughs> the kids are so adorable. <laughs> it's so great. And Melissa, congratulations to you. Transportation Learning Center is very lucky to have you as a designer. So SMEs, my goodness. Let's talk about these things. There's four things we know about SMEs. What do you think those four things might be? Any guesses? Brian? Brian? Yeah. They always, always. And why is that? First of all, they've existed for thousands of years. Did you know that? <laughs> Brian's existed for thousands of years. <laughs> now, if you go back to the Chavez Caves in France and you look at the drawings that are there, I don't know if you've ever heard of these caves, but there was actually an earthquake or something that closed off the entrance to this, so for 32,000 years there was no access, so the air was the same. All the cave drawings stayed like this one. And this is one of the first renderings from a subject matter expert. It's four horses. If you know anything about horses, which I know lots about horses, but I'm told that that's a representation of four different types that someone who really knew what they were doing would have represented on that wall 32,000 years ago. It's incredible, isn't it? They're smart. SMEs are smart people. Albert Einstein's IQ was guessed to be 160. I think that's low. Descartes, 180. Galileo, 185. These are smart people. They are interesting. <laughs> Even though they don't always serve as SMEs, <laughs> when they do, they're interesting. These are fun people to be around. Melissa mentioned that earlier. Once you get to work with a really good group of SMEs, they're a lot of fun. They keep you hopping, too. And they're everywhere. Almost everyone is an SME. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. How many of you consider yourself SMEs? Okay, the rest of you put your hands up. Come on. <laughs> Come on, it's participation. Everybody put your hand up. I want you to write down one thing that you're a subject matter expert in. Write down one thing. You're all subject matter experts. Dr. Cook, you don't have to do this, I know. Dr. Cook's son, Jim, is an expert at being tall. <laughs> so what kind of things are you writing down? Shout them out. Personality. Okay, an SME in personality. Do I have one? I have no. Oh, okay. So you are an expert. <laughs> what are the kind of things we have SMEs in? Come on. Vegetable gardening. Vegetable gardening, okay. Other stuff. Wellness. 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 Child care. 
Cooking. I know. Yeah? Oh, well, that, being a mom, yeah. How many of us are parent SMEs? Yeah. Or grandparent SMEs? Or great grandparent? No. No, we don't. No, no, we don't do that. So the challenge for us as designers is to find ways to work with SMEs, to nurture them, to find relationships with them, to do all kind of wonderful things with our subject matter experts. And one of the things that surprised me when I first started looking at putting together a book on this is how little information there is on SMEs. I would see articles that kind of picked on them. I saw articles that made fun of them. You know, the 10 things that happened to your SMEs, they were all negatives. And I started to think, that's not my relationship with this, folks. This is not what I learned to do. This is not how I learned to grow up with SMEs and become a better designer. And I started to research it and started to think about different ways that we could look at this group of people. And hopefully, we're going to be able to do that. So objectives for tonight is, by the end of this session, you should be able to find the term SME, if you can spell it. List the five types of SMEs. Think about how you select them. Think about how you evaluate them. And five things that you would always do to better your relationship with a subject matter expert. We'll talk about some don'ts too, but we'll, we'll focus on the five pluses. Anything else we want to do? You want to add to this? Yes? Good question. Hold on to that. We have a question session. I have an answer. And this will give me time to think of it. <laughs> Okay, what's SME stand for? Did you ever look this up? All of you Googling. How many Googlers we have? Yeah, I know some of you Google in class. I'm not mentioning any names up here on the stage. Superconducting magnetic energy storage is the biggest hit for SMEs if you Google. Now, Brian knows what that is. I don't know what that is. Society for Mining and Metallurgy and Explorations. Any of you a member of that? No members? Okay. Small to medium enterprises. That's what you get in Europe if you Google SME. But we're going to call them subject matter experts. So, they're more than just experts, aren't they? How many of you work on a regular basis with SMEs? What is your experience? Oh, why am I up here? What's your experience with them? Yeah? They don't have time for you? What else? Arrogant. Arrogant. OK. I know one. All right. All right. I'm not hearing too many positives. Passionate. Ah, that thing. Yeah, that's a problem. OK. Well, one thing that I think we ought to look at as we start to look at subject matter experts is let's put them into categories. Because there are, as near as I can tell, five different kinds. There's probably many more, but these are the five that I think most likely align with what your experience might be. Now, first is a technical SME. These are just strictly content experts. That's, that's what they do. They're smart people. They know their content in and out. They're professional standing. And we'll talk about that in terms of choosing SMEs, how we choose them. But generally, they have professional standing. They have demonstrated expertise. And essentially, what we use them for is design support. So we're asking them to tell us about the content. So Melissa, most of our folks, uh, you know, the, the folks that work for manufacturers and those kind of folks generally are, are technical SMEs. Hybrid SMEs are content experts, but they're also teachers and trainers. So this notion of taking the expertise that we have on content, and then we actually teach in these things. So these are apprenticeship instructors. These are folks that work in very large organizations that rose into training because they were the content expert. How many times have you seen that? Well, the best person in the shop becomes the teacher because, gee, they know everything, even though they may not be the best teacher, but that's how you get there. Instructional SMEs are simply trainers teachers, apprenticeship instructors, whatever, their expertise and what they bring to this whole equation is the fact they know how to teach in a particular content area. They're really good at it. And they have a lot to give to this process. The fourth is a functional SME. And this is something I think a lot of people don't think about, but there are many people on our design teams that are technical experts at what they do. Look around the room tonight. You have technical SMEs, the camera work, 
audio work, all the things around us. If you think about it in terms of the average project, how many times do you have people to do coding? Or you do software, or you get things set up in Blackboard, or whatever you might do. These people are subject matter experts. And I think the more that we think about them that way, and the more that we include them in our subject matter expert family, sometimes a better our relationship might be with them. And the last group is the Sentinels. This is an interesting group. This is the grumpy group. This is the group that's responsible for a lot of the money and a lot of the projects. And they may have some subject matter expertise, but it may be dated. It, it may be wrong. <laughs> but nonetheless, they sit on a board or they are director of a, a program or a project. And they have to make a lot of decisions based on what the design team brings to them. So these sentinels, I consider them subject matter experts because we have to explain the content to them. We have to explain what we're doing with it. So at some point, I consider them subject matter experts. So what do you think of that? Do you think that's reasonable? Five reasonable? Have you thought about it this way before? No? Will you think about it this way later? No. <laughs> Perhaps not. <laughs> so technical, hybrid, functional, instructional, and sentinel. So what we're going to do is we're going to have five subject matter experts come around and come to each table. And you're going to get to ask them questions. No asking for emails or phone numbers, please. But you get to ask them questions, and you get to figure out which one of these SMEs they are. And look at your top sheet of paper. The cleverly canary color. OK, it has choices there, right? So as the folks come around and as you ask them questions, you get to pick which one you think is each of these five types of SMA. So put the number, they're all wearing numbers. And once we do that, we're gonna collect at the bottom where it says your name, we're gonna collect those, rip them off, and we're gonna start to give away some things. So if you don't wanna win anything, that's okay. But if you do, pay special attention. Okay, SMEs. You get one minute with each SME at each table. No questions? So quiet, so quiet. Questions? You did? Well, you're disqualified. I want to play, though. I came to play. You came to play. <laughs> Everybody put your name on the bottom of your paper and cut it off. Just give me the name part. We're going to do a drawing for some books. Just tear it off, yeah, just, you can do it. What if we got them off? We're sharing. We have three names on you still, one. You can still win. <laughs> you have three names on one? Yeah, we wrote notes on your pieces, but we figured that wouldn't go over well. All right, so what'd you do? How'd you do? What do you think? Did you ask the right questions? Yes, we had two number threes. It was a trick question. Did I not get anybody's name? Because we're going to start giving things away unless you don't want anything. Do I have everybody? Okay, I want to introduce Juana Lawrence. Where's Juana? Community Practice Manager for Learning and Development at ASTD. And Juana brought some books for us tonight to give away. And Juana's also the one I work with at ASTD, so you can give her sympathy later. <laughs> But uh, we worked together on this last book. And Juan, I appreciate everything that you've done. Very cool. All right, so what did you think of the exercise? Even though we had a couple extra numbers, um, could you tell who was who? Yes, no. How many of you didn't get all the ESMEs? Yeah, OK. Well, we picked your tables out specifically because, just because. All right. So what did you find out as you started to talk to them? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. And? <laughs> so what you saying? <laughs> Okay. Well, who did you think the technical SME was? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Oh, how about the hybrid SME? All right. Nobody said six. Instructional SME. Oh, wow. All right. Functional. Okay. Sentinel. Five. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, you did good. Congratulations. They didn't want to do this, by the way. <laughs> so we have lots of things to give away. We've got books. We have bags. So first place is a book, second place is two books. <laughs> Third place, I'll autograph it. Uh, so we're going to pick the first name for a copy of SMEs from the ground up. <laughs> is that not what I should pick? That's fine. Martha McCauley? McClary? OK. Juan? Congratulations. OK, if you'll see one afterwards, we'll take care of that. All right, we have more to give away. Molly McCormick? All right, Molly. Would you like Shmees from the ground up or ISD from the ground up? Uh, or neither? So you, Shmees, okay. Lunar Shmee, okay. Who doesn't have ISD from the ground up? <laughs> oh, no. Another? All right, we're going to start giving away these bags. Who wants a bag? I feel like bingo. Okay, Kate. Where's Kate? All right. Book or bag? Book? Okay. So we'll do more giveaways here in a little bit. So tell me what you think about these categories. Do you think it's useful? Do you think it's confusing? Confusing. confusing. Why? Yeah, a little bit. Sure, sure. I think they do in real life, though, right? Yeah. So I think as designers, what do we have to think about? We have to think about what their role is on our project. And how many times do you have technical SMEs that want to tell you how to teach? Ever had that happen? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you ever convert a faculty to online learning when they're the SME and also the instructor? But they're not necessarily good at Blackboard or online learning, but they're incredible in the classroom. So what is their expertise to you as a designer in that process? It's a technical SME, right? Because they're not really up to speed yet on online, but yet you have that, that tension between trying to get them comfortable with their role and what they would like to do. Have you thought about it in terms of Sentinels before? Have you ever thought of them as subject matter experts? Because I think they're a key player in this whole thing that we, we have a tendency to ignore. People on the boards, the people making decisions, and how many times they ask us about instructional design things, and we don't really give them good answers. We don't really know how to explain what we do sometimes. Or we can't explain to them this whole thing called objectives or prerequisites or why we want to have 70 hours of training and they want to have 20, because that's what the budget's for. So I think to consider them as SMEs is key. It really is. Yes? Yeah, that's a good question. If you have a Sentinel that's actually on an SME committee, like a technical committee, what is their role? And many times you see that. We see that transportation learning all the time, where the, they have dual roles. They sit on the board that makes decisions, but they're also subject matter experts in the technical sense. And we found that they're really the gatekeepers for success. If you can make them happy, if you can get them to buy into ISD and buy into what you're doing, they're going to go back to the board and they're going to tell a good story. They're going to tell how well your subject matter group functions. You know, how well things are being run, how efficient things are. 
And from my experience, if you can get them to buy in and participate, you really got a bonus. In fact, I can't think of a time that a Sentinel in a technical committee wasn't a plus. I'm sure somebody will prove me wrong, but at least that was my experience. So let's move on to another part here, and we'll have more fun and more giveaways. So when you select SMEs, first let me ask you, how many of you actually select SMEs or do you get assigned SMEs? Do you get to select? Do you ever get to select? Sometimes. Are you grumpy when you don't get to select? Okay. So let me give you a key to grumpy. The key to grumpy is if you're going to make a, a decision about this, about whether you want to try to get somebody else or somebody better, you better have some ammunition to be able to do that, right? You really be able to, to look at your subject matter experts and say, these are really qualified people in this position or they're not. So whether you're selecting them or whether you are given them or assigned them or forced them, if you can look at different parts of their skill set and make some determinations, then you have an argument for going back and saying maybe this isn't the best fit for this. Or if you get the luxury of actually choosing them, you can look at it that way too and think about some things. So let's look at some criteria, content-based and general skills. So content-based criteria, the first one is relevance of experience. What kind of things do you think of when you think of relevance? Think about a subject matter area. And what does relevance mean to you in terms of picking someone? Okay, so you want, and hold that, that's a good point, and I'll, I'll find another place for that. How many times do you work in content area that constantly changes? All the time. All the time. And what kind of depth do you want in a subject matter expert? You want somebody who's been around for a while, somebody who's seen things change, someone who's still current, but also has a depth of experience to know the difference between what was and what is. And I think those are the kind of things you look at at relevance. Now, in depth, how long have they been doing this, right? I mean, it's, it's not rocket science. But in some fields, five years is a lifetime, right? If you're looking at social media and some of the other things. But in other areas, the more strategic areas, more generalist areas, sometimes, you know, 20 years isn't long enough. Timeliness of experience. How long has it been since they've actually done something in the content area? How many times do you get someone who's a legacy SMA? in the sense that they were really good at what they did. Now they've been in some other department or done something else and they just happen to be given to you or you're getting an opportunity to choose them. And I think that's something you can look at. Yes? Yeah, that gets, gets you right there. Yeah. Yeah, they're never happy anyway, but <laughs> from my experience, of course. So which one of these classifications that you've seen so far would that go into? I would say depth, right? And, and, and relevance. Relevance, yeah, relevance too. So now you've already got three ways that you can tell people that they aren't necessary, right? You can make the argument with this. What about location? This is one thing that I've never heard mentioned before, but something that happens all the time in projects I work in, that the location that someone has spent most of their working life in or their professional life has a real impact on a lot of things that we do within a project and a lot of things that we do based on jargon, based on regional practice, sometimes based on geography and temperature. If we're working in a building trade and we're talking about pouring concrete, you're going to get a whole different experience from somebody in Alaska than you're going to get from somebody in Hawaii. Brian? I also think it's important to remember that the SME is a representative, uh, a representative sample of the uh, total incumbent population. And so they have to be, uh, I think, viewed as a uh, subject matter expert by the, uh, as much as possible by the incumbent uh, group as well. Yeah. So you've got to think about this. And the larger the scope of your project, the more geography and location makes a difference. And think about things that you do internationally. If you're working on an international project, what a lot of us do, you've got to think about a whole other spread of issues 
and you know, geography used kind of in a plurality of ways gets you to a different decision point on who you want to work with and who you think is best suited. So the last one is training and teaching experience. And I think sometimes this is a double-edged sword. Sometimes I don't want a lot of teaching experience or training experience because then I'm told how to train the course or how to set it up in terms of implementation. And especially with the legacy content where people are used to teaching in a classroom and I'm now migrating that online, I've got some real issues with people telling me how to do that if they've never taught online or don't have a smartphone <laughs> or you know, the other obvious uh, points of technology that some of us are used to and some of us aren't. It's in the value system, it's just a way for you to determine whether these things are important or not. So do these five areas seem reasonable to you as things to think about and ways to start to clarify? Right. Um, that uh, I think that's it's almost how you use that information in the training, uh, yeah. and the um, you know the ability of the organization to adapt to what you came up with. Right, and none of us have ever had political issues with the the culture of the workplace, um, especially with this SME groups. So, general skills, communication ability. One thing I found in SMEs, if they don't talk to you, they're not really very valuable. And that might seem obvious. But when you've just spent $5,000 to bring them in for a week and they sit there on their smartphone, I find that to be an issue. A lot of times you don't have it. Writing ability. One thing I've found is there is a real underrating of the abilities of SMEs to help with the design process. And one thing that some SMEs are incredibly good at and like to do is write. And I've seen a lot of projects that would have had to been assigned to a technical writer or to one of the designers that an SME was happy to pick up and write a chapter or write a series of things that we needed to be done or even take pictures or do things like that. So don't underestimate what this group can do for you. And sociability. Have you ever had a group of SMEs that sat around the table and didn't talk to each other? You ever had that experience? That's a ton of fun, isn't it? So when you're looking at these, one of the things you can rate both those that you're interested in using and those that you have is this issue of can they communicate with each other? Are they sociable? Can you work together as a group? And I think those things are important. And I think they're reasonable for us as designers, as managers of this process, to be able to ask whether these people fit within this group. Anything else you would add to general skills? Brian talked about political skills. Yes? Yeah, be able to work together. So get the Legos out and see if you can build something, all five of you. Yes, Jim. Yeah, and how would you define them? Well, it's only for the but they won't do anything. Uh, they'll be there to help you, but collaboration takes it to the next level. They'll really have back and forth. Yeah, very good. Any other thoughts on this? Has it got you thinking about something? Think about it differently? Spurring any comments? Is dinner sitting too heavily? <laughs> Mr. Cook. No <laughs> reliability. Oh, come on, Jim. It, like what? Um, well, I'm thinking of a, a very painful project that had lots of SMEs. And, you know, reliability, you need it for every job. But, hey, when, those, when I had some SMEs that would come through, it was great. And when I had others, they would tell me they would come through again and again, but they wouldn't. And they, or they would send something in that was really clearly incomplete, but they were saying it was fully complete and I knew it wasn't. Yeah. And that hurts. That hurts. Being able to get the project done. And that's one of the criteria that you can evaluate SMEs on. We're not going to talk a lot about that tonight because so we don't have time. But there's information out there on this or stuff in the book, but I'm not trying to sell the book. But it's one of the things that you should think about because you do need to rate their ability to be able to do certain things like meet a deadline. I mean, that's a perfectly reasonable thing. Um, it's also incumbent on the design team to meet deadlines too. Because as soon as you miss one, they're going to miss them all. I mean, there's those kind of relationship issues, too. But I think Jim's right. I mean, this reliability is important. How many million? 535? 635 million dollar website in the new 635. Uh, walking, walking. <laughs> So if you want to set up a spreadsheet for some of the criteria, you could do those kind of things. Um, those are different.
things that you might want to do. Those are initials of SMEs. Um, I just think it's important that you think about those things. So any other comments before we do our next exercise? No comments? Okay. Now you're going to have five candidates for an SME position. And you need to pick one. We will try to have one number three. <laughs> <laughs> Although two number threes was fun. All right. Great to you. We got the numbers right. <laughs> Don't worry. I'm going okay. See, John brought a peanut butter pie, so it doesn't matter what he does. He's got an A in 602 anyway. Okay. All right, so ask them questions. They all have a role. They're going to be in role. Try to shake them. Okay. Table to table. Table to table. Table to table. We have one, two. And we're going to call it quits. You got to make a choice based on what you know. Come on up. Okay, all the SMEs, if you'll come up, please. All right, if someone didn't show up at your table, then they're not reliable. <laughs> As you can see, some of our SMEs like to talk more than other SMEs like to talk. All right, who are we missing? One, two, three, I'm missing two Shmees. I'm missing one Shmee. Deb, where's Deb? Deb. So who do you think is our extrovert among the SMEs? <laughs> I got your number, Deb. All right, SME number one, stand up. Who's number one? Stand up. All right, who wants number one? Nobody. Nobody? Aww. Nobody? We do. Woo! Nobody? <laughs> All right, number two. Number two, stand up. Number two. Come on. Wow, it's personal. Number three, Deb. <laughs> Who wants number three? We'll take her. Huh? One? <laughs> You're on your own, Brian. It's not speed dating. <laughs> Maybe something Dr. Williams should consider in the future. Number five? All right. Well, I think one of your companies is going to be very happy and the other four, I don't know. So what did you find out? For the ones you did interview, is this representative of what you see in terms of qualifications and how you get, it is from my experience. What did you think? Would you hire any of them, really? I would. But sometimes you get stuck and you get number one <laughs> or number two or number three. But I think if you look at the criteria, what kind of things did you hear from these folks, the ones you talked to? They didn't know anything. Yeah. <laughs> and from my experience, that's, you know, you get SMEs that really don't know anything, right? Because why? They're well placed, they're legacy, they're related. Available. Yeah, the available, right? There's something about available. So I think this is good. So thank you to all of my 602 students. Can you imagine being humiliated like this and, and having to go to class? They're great sports, and I appreciate it, and thank you all very much. If you don't want to sit up here and be embarrassed anymore, you can get down.
But as everybody knows, if you want to come Monday nights to 602 on campus, we're down on South Campus now, you're welcome to come and join. Even if you've graduated, if you've had 602 online, if you don't like me, if there's anything that you <laughs> just come and say, come down and, and have fun with us. But you're more than welcome to do that. So let's talk about evaluation. We talked about these criteria before. But I think there's one thing that a lot of us as designers, as people that have to work with subject matter experts don't do, is evaluate SMEs, except informally. And one thing I found is if you have a formal process for evaluation, you have some information that you can use if you need it to find out not only who's good, but also who you don't want to use next time. If you have to remove somebody, you have some real ammunition to be able to do that. And I don't think that's a small thing. Because a lot of these decisions are made without information, but if you come up with things that are important to you and important to your project, then maybe there's something you can do and work on. So obviously relevance, depth, length, timeliness, location, and training. And also think about, and this is, I think gets to what Jim was talking about, reads and reviews materials is required. I think this is one of the points of evaluation that becomes obvious very quickly when people just don't read and don't respond and don't become involved in it. Second thing is comments is required. Many times you send around drafts of things, you send around copies of objectives, you send around diagrams or photos or anything that might be involved in the process. And the key people that you need to talk to you about these things don't get back to you, don't respond. This is a point of evaluation. This is something you need to keep track of. You can also think about this notice of supply supplemental materials, et cetera. There are those that come to meetings, from my experience, that have boxes full of things that they've looked through, that they've thought about, that they've, they've brought to work on the content with. And there's folks that show up with nothing, less than nothing. And I think it's a real point of evaluation, a positive point of evaluation for those that supply materials and bring materials to do supplemental work. Deadlines. How many times do you have deadline issues? Ever? <laughs> Always? As a design team, do you meet your deadlines? And it's kind of the place to start, right? But if you have people that don't meet deadlines, you have to do something about that. That's, that's from my experience, that's not something you can really negotiate. Returns, calls, emails, and other contacts, this point in two, you have to be able to communicate with folks. If they start avoiding you, then there's a problem. There's something else going on. And you need to address that. And attends meetings. How many times do people just don't even attend the meeting? or don't get on the phone call, or don't do the things they need to do. So remember, these are all valuative points, things that you can look at and start to rate and compare the people that you work with. You can apply this across a lot of different places, but I think if you start to think about your subject matter experts differently than most of us do, and start to really rate and look at their qualities, the things they bring to the table, the things they perhaps don't do well, then you have a point of discussion and also a lot of things that you can do about it. So, is there anything you would add besides the things that I've talked about? From your experience, what are the other things, if you would evaluate an SME, what would you do it based on? With what, Catherine? Oh, before, yeah. Yeah, to compare what they've done. Look at their portfolio, yes. Yeah, yeah. if there are people that are doing a lot of consulting work, you can always get references and, and things like that from them. Internally, it's a little bit more difficult. Yes? I think their attitude is important, too. Yeah. Regarding the subject matter expert, they might know a lot, but they've already decided that this is a two-month, three projects, and they're going to do it. Yeah, I think it's right on the money. Attitude is important. How many of you have seen a change in attitude from the beginning to the middle to the end of a project? I mean, a lot of times I see people come in grumpy. They really don't want to be part of it. They're doing it because they're assigned. Um, they're doing it because they're excess, you know, whatever reason they're there. And they really start to like what they're doing. And by the end of it, it's one of your greatest assets, the people that will go out and sell what you're doing. Sir? I think also uh, their boss is committed to the project. Yeah. And that's one of the other things that I think is important. We're not going to talk about too much tonight because I didn't put it in, in the slides. But when you negotiate someone's time internally, you're talking about in-house client relationship, getting a clear understanding of what time is and when time is available 
and who's going to be budgeted for that time. And I've seen a lot of cases where people were available, but they were available the last two weeks of the year, right? Or, or during the summer when nobody else could use them and your team's not together. So part of having a subject matter expert, especially in an internal relationship, is making that contract with their supervisor or whoever is the person of authority so you can actually say, this is the person I need, can I have them when I need them, and can I have them long enough? And I've seen them where they could only work the last half hour of the day, or they could only work one day of the week, last day of the week, or whatever day they were supposedly not busy, which they would tell you, of course, was nonsense. But, and then the cluster of weeks at the end, those kind of things. So I think it's a good point. What are the things from your experience, sir? Let us know how you do with that. <laughs> I would agree with you entirely. It's, it's great to have a, a, a no opinion, no value SME that you can just tell me about X and do it, right? But I think one thing that leads into that, and one of the rules that I have that I try to follow is I don't have a value system about a lot of things except instructional design. When I'm working on a project, that's what I know. I know the project. I know how the project runs. I don't think about the politics of the office. I don't think about the politics of the SMEs and all the other things that can creep into these discussions. And I try to cut those discussions off when they start because it's not relevant to what we're trying to do. So in that sense, I absolutely agree with you. If you can find people that'll play that, great. Brian? Yeah, it, this is so important. I mean, building a relationship with your subject matter experts is more than just that content piece. It's about making them part of your family. And that's about being on time. That's about having materials ready. That's about showing appreciation for what they do. And there's other things we'll talk about here in a second that I think are real important things that you'd, you'd have to do with them. But so many times I've seen them completely ignored, abandoned, they show up, you're not ready, the room's not ready, the light's not on. You know, all the little things that show respect for somebody that invests time in what you do. And we don't make that effort. And I'll tell you what, they notice. If you're sloppy about that, that's the way they're going to react to you, at best. So making the, the environment good for them and a place where they feel comfortable and welcome. And for those of us that really have served as SMEs before we ever thought about the design role, I think back at the times when I came in as a subject matter expert and how I was treated. And it really made a difference, not only in the projects that I worked on, but the relationship I had to instructional design and the training function. It really can build a future path for these people to be good designers and part of what we do. Think about how many of us came from the world of SMEs. A lot of us were SMEs before we were ever trainers or designers or anything else that we do. How many of you feel that way, that you were a relatively well-established SME before you got started? So what made you decide to come into the training world? Employment, <laughs> that's always a good thing. But yeah, I'm willing to bet that all of you had a relationship at some point as a subject matter expert that was warm and welcoming and it made you feel like a professional and you saw the other aspects of the work that we do and it welcomed you into that. And I think the more you can do that, the better off you are. So do's and don'ts. If you don't show appreciation, forget it. You might get the work, you might not, you're not gonna get much else. I mean, it seems like basic communication skills, but I can tell you how many times I haven't seen anybody make any effort to make SMEs feel appreciated. And how are the ways that you can make them feel appreciated? Feed them. Feed them. <laughs> okay, so Monday night, 602, what's the one thing we do? We eat, right? Everybody knows the 602 on Monday nights is about the food. We do exchange some ideas about instructional design, but it's mostly about dinner. And what do adults like to do? A lot. Like to eat. So for me, it's food, it's coffee, it's knowing where the restrooms are. It's, you know, all the little kind of basic things that show respect and appreciation. Have any of you ever thought about giving them a certificate? Say, thank you for doing this. 
doing something special for them. We'll talk about celebrations and things here in a moment. Yes? Yeah, All right. those things are so important. Let them know you appreciate it. Providing clear guidelines. Here's one thing that I've found sends SMEs over the cliff faster than anything, is if you don't tell them what they're there for. And the other part of that is telling them what your job is. And one of the first things I think you should do is explain everybody's roles and responsibilities. So whether you call it a kickoff, whatever you want to call it, make sure that they know you're the design function. Here are the things you're going to do. You don't have to worry about writing these silly objectives. You don't have to do all this prerequisite stuff. We're going to help you find those places for this information to fit. But your role is to bring us the best content you can and to go out of your way to make sure that everything's relevant and in the way we need it and when we need it. But I've seen so many times where SMEs just sit there and they're completely flustered because they don't know what their role is. And they don't know what you do. They have no idea what we do. They don't know they're shmees. They think that's a derogatory term. Some of you are laughing <laughs> because you think it's a derogatory term. OK, be flexible. These are very busy people. Sometimes you have to move meetings around. Sometimes you have to move days around. But remember, they've probably got lots of other stuff to do, too. I don't know if too many SMEs are sitting around waiting for you to call. If they are, I wouldn't use them because nobody else is. So be flexible. Be relevant. Make them part of your team. Don't make them something different. Don't make them adjunct. Make them part of your team. If you have name tags, have, everybody has a name tag. You know, if they have a locker, everybody has a locker. You know, just make sure everybody feels like they're part of what you're doing. Big deal. And celebrating milestones and victories. I can't tell you how important this is. We just had a situation, Melissa and I working with a group in Philadelphia. And we went up there, and these are some pretty hardcore SMEs. So, you know, been doing this for a long time and no nonsense and always paying attention. And some of them sit in the meetings, they don't have a lot to contribute in terms of conversation. They'll contribute materials and do anything you ask, but they don't really participate in the sense that, you know, you would think they felt like they were part of the group or whatever. So, one thing that we have as a tradition is when we're done with a module or done with a section, we always go out to dinner. And we make sure that everybody can be there. And when we can, we pay for it. Otherwise, we go to an expensive place, <laughs> and they can all pay for it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but we sit around and have dinner, and at the end of dinner, we hand out certificates of appreciation to the SMEs. And the last thing we do is we ask each of them to say something, how they feel their experience with us is going, how they felt about being a subject matter expert within our projects. And the things we found out are incredible. The people that didn't say a thing or really feel, you know, observing them that they were part of what was going on would stand up with tears in their eyes and talk about how important this was to them. And they talk about their legacies within their particular fields of expertise. I'm leaving a legacy to the people that follow me because of this instruction or because of this course. And we even had one individual who's very high up in SEPTA, which is at Regional Transit in Philadelphia came down to this celebration on the anniversary of when he met his wife 30 years ago, which was a big deal to them, and he brought his wife. And he stood up and talked about how this was important to him. So if you don't give people an opportunity to celebrate and to reflect and to spend some time thinking about their role and how important it is for them, you miss an opportunity. And every time we re-engage with this group of SMEs, they're excited. They can't wait to get going. They get right to work, they get going, they want to know when dinner is. But that's okay. That's okay. So even if it's a short five minute thank you with a silly candle and a cupcake or you know anything that works for you, take that time and do that. They deserve it. They really do deserve it. So things to never do, okay, this is kind of the opposite of the first five things. <laughs> Clever, isn't it? <clears throat> Ignore them or take them for granted. We don't want to do that. Talk in ISD jargon. How many of you are guilty of this? Okay, raise your hands. My name's Chuck. I say Shmi. 
I say Gagne, I mean, you say Gagne. Nine events of instruction, four parts objectives, you know, all these things, forget it, don't use it. They don't care, they don't know, it makes them feel isolated, they don't like it. Express an opinion about content. Now maybe you'll disagree with this, but I've always found it a real relevant point to not get discussions going between the instructional designers and the subject matter experts about the content. Okay, designers don't need an opinion about the content. Gather the content, make sense of it, do the other things, but don't get in a food fight over content if you're a designer. Maybe you disagree with that, but I've always found that to be useful. Miss deadlines, forget that, and fail to communicate. There's nothing worse than people showing up to a meeting and you asking them about something they know nothing about because you haven't sent them copies of things or you haven't communicated it to them. So just obvious communication things. Any do's or don'ts that you would add? Sir. Yeah. yeah, good points. Brian? I think another thing to do is to manage their energy. And what I mean by that is, is that doing analysis is hard work. And uh, if you do it right, it's, it's real hard work. And so if there comes a time when you know, you're supposed to finish work at 5 o'clock, but at 3.30, everybody's just zoning out. Uh, stop, move, come back another time. Uh, but manage their energy. Yeah, I think that's an important thing. The more you do this, you realize that there's no eight-hour day with a content committee. They're gone in five or six. Mentally, there there's just no energy left. So if you're thinking about doing eight, 12-hour days with content experts, you're kidding yourself. Be realistic about what they can contribute. And you're exactly right. I mean, I think five or six hours is a long time. Melissa, what do you think? I mean, what happens at 2 o'clock when you start at 8? They're done. I mean... There's just a point of, of no reasonable return. So you have to think about that too. This is very, very cognitive. I mean, they're really thinking and working and, and really concentrating on stuff and they get tired quickly. I mean, you gotta really kind of manage that process. So I think that's good. Other comments people have? Yes. Okay, so the, the, the point of have at least a talking knowledge of what's going on. So you know the salient points and you can at least act functional with that. I think that's a relevant point, yeah. Any other comments? Yes? One thing that I do a lot is have a lot of review meetings with our, my subject matter experts I work with. And so one of my best practices, I always have extra printed materials of the content I'm covering. Mm -hmm. Even though I'll send them in advance via email, I can't always send them in <laughs> Out the materials that That's a good point. If you're going to send materials, you send it in an email, how many times are they going to print out a 500 page manual? They're not going to do it, right? I mean, think about in a continuum of one page to however many pages, some of the things that we use are hundreds and hundreds of pages. So it's unrealistic to think they're going to do that. That's a good point. So, any other things? Yes. Yeah, I'd say when you go over their head, you're done. I mean, anytime you go to the boss, that's it. Yes, are you the boss? <laughs> no, but I'll go to the boss and say, thanks for sending that. Person. Oh, of course, yeah, say thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. That's part of your celebration, right? And the other thing is, do you give your subject matter experts copies of your final product? Never. I always do. I always do. Because I can go back 10, 15 years later and see it hanging on their wall or on their desk or in their bookcase. They're really proud of that. They're really, really proud of what they do. And if it's something tangible like a manual, 
Always make sure you list subject matter experts in there. Don't make them silent partners. Make them very obvious and visible partners. Really important things. All right. Yes. You won. <laughs> Did you win next time? <laughs> yeah. Good. Good. Yes. I was going to say, going back to when you said, you know, making your subject matter experts as part of your ISD team. So one thing I like to do is after I finish building and creating my training materials, whether they're web-based or printable, even though we have a separate quality assurance team that goes over the content prior to it being deployed live. I like to go back to my subject matter expert after I'm done and also give them the materials that are completed so they can validate the information yeah, as well. So absolutely. Right. Validation is an important part of using your SMEs. Make sure that they sign off, check off and stuff. Well, this is good. I hope it's giving you some things to think about. I hope maybe you've looked at this a different way, thought about these different categories, thinks about, think about evaluation, because I think a lot of people don't take the time to do evaluation. Like this isn't a necessary part of what you need to do. I think it's a critical part of what you need to do. You really need to keep a track on this, be able to do this. So on your tables is your level eight evaluation, which is a level two. <laughs> you can finish that if you like. Greg, we want to give away some more bags and stuff too. We got. Would you like to do a drawing for some, some of these bags? Ooh. Yeah? That's, come on, come on, come on. Why don't you do a little better? Do a little better. John, do you have the name bag? Is that it up here? Yeah. Heidi Liggins. Heidi. Heidi. Come on, you got to make the walk. Thank <laughs> you. Who? Who is it? May Golden. May Golden, May. May, come on. That's all. May deserves a little bit more. <laughs> All right. Okay, that side of the room is not. Thank you. Melissa. Melissa. Yeah. Yeah. They were starting to move her. Just first name, Sharia. Sharia. James Gipple. James. John Rottenberg. John. Yes, my pleasure. You didn't hear us, did you? Here. Yeah. You can give me that later. I'll be all right. There you go. Denise Woods. Denise? Okay. This is for extra food, too, if you go back through. Bob Demarco. Bob. Yes, thank you, sir. Great case. Oh, no. <laughs> nah, I think that was an error. Can't have any guys with ponytails winning stuff. That's it. Verdell? <laughs> Verdell? All right. I still don't believe Greg won something. 
Erica, come on up. Yes, sir. One more. Come Barb on Walters. Mark. Barb Walters. Barb. See, I promise you you'd win something. All right, last but not least, I have something special for Dr. Hodel. Since he's a double graduate of UMBC. <laughs> Wow. Join me. Thank you, Dr. Hodel. Thank you, Thank you so much. His book is on sale. If you want to buy his book, it's great. I've no, already read it. No. They're selling outside in the lobby. Don't, don't. And I'll be around. Anybody would like to further discuss any of this? We appreciate you all coming tonight. Thank you so much.